Hello and welcome to this reflection from Stretton Vale Baptist Church. We're on the final in our series that we've been looking at where we've been examining the four degrees of love as proposed by Bernard of Clairvaux. So we're on this final degree in which um, Bernard talks about um, love of self for God's sake. Now I'm actually going to be moving away from Bernard of Clairvaux because he talks about something that doesn't really, that we can't really achieve very often and I think it would be more helpful to us if we think about how we can actually um, think about love and how we love in our daily basis. So I will explain Bernard's fourth degree because it is definitely interesting to think about but then I will develop it to have a different or at least an extended understanding. So in Bernard's writing on the four degrees of love he uses the fourth degree to talk about that, that those few moments that we're able to escape ourselves and to just be completely filled with God's love. This is what he says, wherein man does not even love self save for God's sake. So this requires us to lose a sense of ourselves, except as an extension of God. Have you ever been so caught up in worship of God that you forget your own cares, worries, agendas, duties, thoughts and feelings? Have you ever been so amazed by the presence of God that you have become empty of yourself? Bernard argues that the fourth degree of love is such as that, and one that we can only catch a fleeting glimpse of while we are living in our earthly bodies. During these moments our love becomes that of God. Our wills become aligned completely with God. Our minds unite with the Almighty God. So perhaps an illustration may help to explain what Bernard is talking about. If you have a glass of wine and you drop a single drop of water into the wine, the water droplet will take on the colour, taste, smell and sensation of the wine. Yet it does nothing to dilute or change the wine itself. So it's like us if we connect with God in this most amazing way. We become completely connected with God and lose our own selfish desires and concerns. And instead we see the world through God's eyes and we are united to his heart. I believe that it is this experience that Paul had when he wrote to the Philippians in Philippians 1 verse 20, verses 21 to 26. And he said this, For to me... To live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labour for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far, but it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I, will, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith so that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ will abound on account of me. So Paul was so overwhelmed by the presence of God that he longed to join God for eternity, which is why he was able to say that to die is gain. However, he was also in tune with God's will, and so he knew that God was working through him and that God hadn't finished with him yet. God wanted Paul to continue preaching the gospel which is why Paul said that to live is Christ, because Paul was living for Christ instead of himself. But these blissful moments never last long. We come back down to earth with a mighty bump and are assaulted with all the selfish cares and needs of ourselves and of the world as we return to seeing the world through our own eyes. We find ourselves called back to what Bernard calls our own realm of existence. And this can be difficult, even painful, as we find ourselves wrenched away from such amazing union with God. And therefore, it is important to use these fleeting moments to inspire and encourage our daily walk with God. And so it's here that I'm going to depart from Bernard's four degrees by suggesting that we, if we are fortunate enough to experience that blissful union with God, 
in which we're able to forget our, our sakes, ourselves for the sake of seeing the world through God's eyes, then this needs to fuel the way in which we love in the day-to-day -day moments. This is because when we experience union with the perfect love of God, it is not just so that we can marvel in the experience or boast about it or use it to feel good for, about ourselves. Instead, it should encourage us to live, think, speak and act as God does, to be filled with his love and desire for the world and for ourselves. Our love for God should influence the very way we live our lives. It should flow through our entire being so that we find ourselves acting in ways which honour God, <clears throat> even if we are not tr consciously trying to. When we accept Jesus and turn our hearts to loving God, the Holy Spirit comes to dwell within us and he transforms us. Sometimes that change is dramatic and evident to all. In Ezekiel 36 verse 26, God says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. The love of God is so powerful it can convict us of where our hearts have been hardened and soften them into hearts of flesh. It can breathe new life into places we long thought were dead. We all have a story of how meeting God has changed us. Perhaps some of those stories are more dramatic than others, but they are all valuable, precious stories that demonstrate amazing power of the way that God's love and mercy can transform us as the Holy Spirit lives in us. One dramatic story of transformation is of course from Paul or Saul as he was before meeting Christ on the Damascus road. There aren't many more there aren't many examples of a more dramatic transformation than Paul's where he was determined to root out and kill any Christian he came across to then becoming the most prolific evangelist for Jesus of the New Testament. God took Paul's hardened heart of hatred, which looked to kill those he was against, and changed it to become a heart full of love that longed for all to know God. It's likely that Paul's Damascus Road experience was one of those blissful moments that Bernard of Clairvaux talked about, but Paul didn't just remain focused on that moment, but he used that moment to fuel him in his mission for Jesus as he spread the gospel to anyone who would listen. This is how we should allow God's love to change our hearts. And the Holy Spirit can cause a huge and immediate change in our lives, or he can do it more gradually and subtly so that we as we look back in our lives, it's only then we realise how much God has impacted us and made us into the people we are designed to be. 2 Corinthians 3 says, And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Or in other words, that as we focus our, our lives, our, our attention, our love on God, we are being transformed into his image more and more each day as the Holy Spirit works in us. Sometimes the changes and the transformations that seem to happen are a natural cause of allowing the Holy Spirit within us, an unconscious growing and transforming through the Holy Spirit to become more like God. However, God has also given us free will, the ability to choose how we live our lives. He doesn't want to be puppet a puppet master who controls our every moment and thought. This means that we also need to consciously choose, to consciously make a choice each day, whether we want to live and love in the way God calls us. We have to decide in each moment whether we will allow God's love to govern our lives or if we, <coughs> if we follow our own selfish desires. Romans 12 reminds us that we need to choose not to conform to the pattern of this world, 
but to focus on being transformed by the renewing of our mind. This is not always going to be easy, and there will be times when we falter and fall, but God will help us as we learn what it means to love like God loves. So are we willing to make that choice each and every day, each and every moment, to act in God's love, to be filled with God's love? But what does that actually mean practically? Let me read from Matthew 22, verses 34 to 40. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, <coughs> an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbour as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. When Jesus was asked about the greatest commandment, he replied with the two commandments that summed up the entirety of the law. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and with all your mind, and love your neighbour as yourself. In these commands, Jesus demonstrates that our love needs to be a very deliberate choice. We can't just vaguely or half-heartedly love. We are to love with all our heart, soul and mind. To love as if we are loving ourselves. In our modern day, we often refer to love as a warm, fuzzy feeling or an airy feeling, sometimes as fleeting, temporary or even capricious. A number of songs that talk about love as if it's of nothing, nothing of any importance is quite staggering. But di di during Jesus' time, love had a more grounded meaning. Love was tied deeply into action. To love God is to obey him and follow his directions. To love another human is to act in their interest, to help them and care for them, not just emotionally, but practically. Jesus expanded the Jewish understandings of love, particularly towards loving their neighbour. Jewish religious authorities of Jesus' day used the command to love your neighbour as a limitation a boundary rather than an invitation to open act and acceptance in loving others. By this I mean that they strictly defined who was to be included in the category of neighbour and who wasn't, thereby creating an us and them mentality. This allowed them to emphasise love towards other people in the Jewish community while justifying their hatred towards outsiders, Gentiles, Samaritans, Romans, Greeks, etc. But as demonstrated by the parable of the Good Samaritan, Jesus interpreted the command to love your neighbour as a call to love all our fellow humans, whether or not they felt follow the same religion, laws, customs, culture, values, etc. Jesus made it clear that God intends for his command not to be seen as a reason to limit our love, but instead as a motivation to cause our love to continue to grow and grow. He wants us to see the world through his lens of love and grace, a lens which says all people are precious and treasured, all are made in the image of God, and so should be valued for the person they are and not judged based on various similarities or differences. In fact, not only <clears throat> did Jesus demonstrate the extension of the, <coughs> of the command to love our neighbour by telling the story of the Good Samaritan, but he actually went further to demonstrate how important the command to love is. Let me read from Matthew 5, verses 43 to 48. <coughs> you have heard that it was said, love your neighbour and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you may be children of your Father in heaven. 
He causes his sun to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Jesus didn't want there to be any mistake or misunderstanding with regard to what the law was trying to teach people about love. <clears throat> in both the parable of the Good Samaritan and in his discussions on the, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus makes it very clear that the law is underpinned by love. Rich, costly, far-reaching love. And this love extended even towards one's enemy. We are to love our enemy as Jesus loved his, so much that he was prepared to die for those who hate him. As if it were not reason enough to learn to love our enemies because God commands us, Jesus also makes a moral argument for the importance of love. He says, if you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? We all have morals and standards to which we hold ourselves to. And this was true for the people who were listening to Jesus during the Sermon on the Mount. And these people would have wanted to claim that they had higher standards than the tax collectors and pagans. So when Jesus used them as a comparison, he was essentially challenging his listeners to do better than those they looked down upon. To love without reward. To love those who may hate you. And this is a challenge he issues to us too. How does love, God's love influence our own love? As we finish our series on the four degrees of love, let's consider the question, how are we being transformed by God's Holy Spirit to love more fully, more completely, with our whole body, <laughs> with our whole body, mind and soul? And how does that love then translate into our day-to-day -day life as we encounter different people? Are we prepared to love through our actions, to our neighbours and to even to our enemies? Ultimately, ask yourself the question, how is God calling you to a life defined by love?